Your Excellency, Bishop Williamson accuses you of being too black and white in your thought. What is your reaction? Well, the last time that I heard that accusation was in the modernist seminary in the 1960s. Uh, no one has said that to me since that time, which is 50 years ago. And of course, it was the modernists who said it to me, that my thinking was too black and white. So uh, to hear it from Bishop Williamson's lips is, is rather odd because it brings me right back to the days of, of the modernists. And uh, uh, it, the, it is a virtue to think in black and white, that is, uh, to think that what is, is, and what is not, is not, because that's the way reality is. So, uh, I guess do you uh, don't agree with Bishop Williamson when he says that in real life things are often gray? No, it, as I said, reality either is or is not. And that means the, there, there is, uh, uh, that's known as the principle of contradiction, that it's something uh, is or is not. There is no gray between existence and non-existence. So something uh, is true or it is not true. Gray only exists as a state of the mind. That is, when we are confused about what reality is. So it, it, the, the concrete reality is never gray. It is either one or the other. It either is or is not. But our, our perception of it could be gray in the sense that we do not understand everything that we, uh, that we see or we, we might have lack of certitude. But certainly in the question of infallibility and indefectibility, there is no gray. It, it is very clear how the church is infallible and how the church is indefectible. There is no gray at all. So, uh, so he, he is speaking from, uh, I would say, a very modern point of view that, that things are gray, we cannot define them. That is typically modernist, I'm sorry to say. And what do you think, Your Excellency, of uh, Bishop Williamson's description of papal infallibility and the universal ordinary magisterium? Well, as always, he is mixed up on papal infallibility. He does not understand it. Uh, yes, he is correct concerning solemn papal magisterium, that when the conditions that are set down by the Council of the Vatican in 1870 are met, then the Pope is infallible. Yes, he's correct on that. But he still is proposing, despite my many uh, uh, monitions to the contrary, the a cone theory of universal ordinary magisterium. Uh, this theory was concocted by a priest at a cone as a way of justifying a resistance to Vatican II and at the same time recognizing the papacy of those who were promoting Vatican II and its reforms. And he said that, well, let, let me first talk about the Church's teaching concerning universal ordinary magisterium. And it is this, that when the Pope and the bishops in unanimity, moral unanimity, which means most of them, uh, teach concerning faith and morals to the whole church, then uh, you have something called universal ordinary magisterium. So it has to concern faith and morals. Also, it has to be contained in revelation, at least implicitly. And it has to be taught by the Pope in union with all of the bishops who are dispersed throughout the world. If, that, if those conditions are met, then you have universal ordinary magisterium, and according to that same council of 1870, we owe that the ascent of faith, divine faith. So it has the same infallibility as a papal pronouncement, which is solemn magisterium, which is very rare. Uh, an example of universal ordinary magisterium is the teaching concerning guardian angels. There is no uh, solemn declaration concerning the existence of guardian angels, but it is universally taught by the Catholic Church. So it is impossible 
therefore, that the Pope and the bishops together are teaching what is contained in Revelation, teaching it universally to the whole church, could err. That's impossible because they are the teaching church and they are assisted in that role by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> the erroneous position of a cone, which Bishop Williamson is, is spouting here, is that the universal ordinary magisterium only qualifies as such and only is infallible when the Pope and bishops teaching universally are in uh, are, are uh, consenting to or saying the same thing as their predecessors. It's something like a, a children's dot to dot drawing that when you have a, a series of the same doctrines, you can see a pattern. And if the Pope and bishops stay within that pattern, then they are infallible. But if they don't stay within the pattern, then they're not infallible. And therefore, the Pope and bishops in that system could conceivably deceive the whole church by teaching something contrary to faith and morals. And this is absolutely contrary to the notion of infallibility. And I defy Bishop Williamson to show me that theory that he proposes in a traditional dogmatic theology book because it doesn't exist. All of the dogmatic theologians say exactly the same thing and the popes say exactly the same thing, including Pope Pius XII and other popes concerning the universal ordinary magisterium. This was concocted. It doesn't exist anyplace else. And in the book that is written by this priest from a cone, uh, there are footnotes for many other things that he is saying, which were true. But when he gets to this uh, section on the universal ordinary magisterium and proposes this theory, which I have just, uh, just described, there are no footnotes. There are no references to any theologians whatsoever because there are none who say this. This is a concocted theory which is just not true and which offends the infallibility of the Catholic Church. As I said, it's like a child's dot to dot just as the child sees eventually a chicken forming as he goes from dot to dot. So also in this system, if, they, if a, an image of continuity is being formed well, then you have infallibility, and then you have true universal ordinary magisterium. But if there's a divergence from the image, that is a lack of continuity with what went before, then it's not universal ordinary magisterium. And as I said, that permits the idea that the whole hierarchy could teach to the Catholic Church something which is against faith or morals, and that is contrary to the Church's infallibility and I think is objectively heretical. Your Excellency, also uh, Bishop Willis Williamson seems to um, present a new notion of the church's indefectibility. Can you comment on that? Yes, uh, he uh, sees indefe uh, indefectibility as uh, merely the survival of the church. And he talks about defections uh, as being the defections of many Catholics to Islam in the uh, 6th and 7th centuries and also the, the defection of many Catholics to Protestantism in the 16th century. And this is, uh, this is not what the church means by indefectibility. What the Catholic Church means by indefectibility is that the Catholic Church in her universal teaching concerning faith and morals in her sacred liturgy and in her disciplines cannot propose anything that is contrary to faith or morals that the church is always holy in these regard in the, in, in the in these aspects that is dogma and of course morals with that 
uh, liturgy and discipline. That means that it can never teach a false religion. It can never defect from the truth in its official teaching, and that includes universal ordinary magisterium. Uh, it cannot propose to us to do something evil, uh, uh, give us an evil discipline or an evil law. It cannot give to us a false liturgy, a liturgy that does not uh, portray the truth concerning the Holy Eucharist and the other sacraments, that it is assisted by Christ uh, from doing this. And this is the whole power of the church is that it has this assistance from Christ precisely not to do these things. It is preserved from error. Pope Pius IX said in 1868 in a, in a letter addressed to Protestants, he said, in this church, meaning the Catholic church, the truth must always remain stable and inaccessible to every change so as to keep absolutely intact the deposit confided to her and for whose safeguard the presence and assistance of the Holy Ghost have been promised to her forever. In one sentence, that's what the indefectibility of the Catholic Church means, that, that large numbers of people defect from the Catholic Church does not have anything to do with the indefectibility of the Catholic Church. The, the indefectibility is the absolute stability of the church in proposing the truth and in proposing the, the true liturgy and in proposing true disciplines and, and disciplines which are not sinful. All right? Now, if we compare that to what has happened since Vatican II, why are we reacting so much to Vatican II and its reforms, what he calls conciliarism? Why are we reacting to all of that why have we set up an apostolate against those who have imposed the, the doctrines of Vatican II, who have imposed the new code of canon law, who have imposed the new liturgy, and all of the other things that have come out of Vatican II, ecumenism, many other disciplines that are contrary to faith. Why are we opposing them if th those things do not constitute a new and false religion which is not the Catholic religion. For what reason are we doing that? And the, our very actions attest to the fact that we know by faith that this, the, what has come out of Vatican II is a new and false religion. Otherwise, we would not oppose it. Indeed, we have gone to so much trouble to oppose it. It would be much easier just to go to our local parish churches and accept everything. But we have made our lives a lives, of, a li lives of opposition to this new religion. And we are staking our eternal salvation on this opposition to this new religion. So, therefore, we cannot associate this new religion with the teaching authority of the Catholic Church with the authority to teach, rule, and sanctify the church which is given by Christ, this church which is assisted by the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, we must say that the church has defected. This Catholic church which is, to, to, which is promised the assistance of Christ and the Holy Ghost, that it has defected by giving the whole world this false religion. And so the only conclusion is that those who are promoting this false religion do not represent the Catholic Church. They are phony prelates who do not represent the Catholic Church and they are manifesting their phoniness by the fact that they are promulgating this new religion. Your Excellency, you mentioned a conciliarism as um, used, the term used by Bishop Williamson and can you speak about this notion of a conciliar church and Catholic church and those distinctions? Yes, the, the Iconians in general uh, distinguish between the conciliar church and then the Catholic church. And they go so far as to say that, uh, the, that the Novus Ordo Pope is the Pope of two different churches, the conciliar church and the Catholic church. And sometimes he speaks as the head of the conciliar church, and sometimes he speaks as the head of the Catholic church. And the way that you can tell how he's speaking is that 
the Society of St. Pius X will put what he says into a sifter, essentially, and will sift out for you the Catholic stuff, and the other will remain in the sifter. And I, of course, reject that whole theory. The, the precise problem that we're facing is that the modernists did not break away from the Catholic Church. That they, through subterfuge, uh, managed to rise to powers, uh, to places of power, and they then used that to uh, impose this new religion. Now, in fact, they didn't have the power, but they seemed to have the power. And they used that to promote this new religion. It's like rats at the bottom of the ship that have gotten up to the top deck and are now steering the ship both at the rudder and at the, at the wheel. Uh, but they have not declared themselves outside of the ship and no one else has declared them outside of the ship. That is the precise problem that we have. But that doesn't mean that they cease to be rats. These are modernists who are not Catholics, who are uh, attempting to foist upon the church this new religion. And our reaction to them must be precisely that they are not in fact true prelates of the Catholic Church. They have no authority at all to teach, rule, and sanctify the Church. They are phony prelates, as I said, and that they must be avoided and, and we must flee from them and accuse them. We must take the mask off of their faces. That, that they are wearing as if they are true prelates of the Catholic Church, just rip that mask off and identify them as non-Catholics who should be thrown out of the Catholic Church. And that is how we will indeed show the indefectibility of the Catholic Church when the sheep realize that, the, that there is a wolf in sheep's clothing in the sheepfold. What do the sheep do? They, they run as fast as they can from him and reject him. They get away from him. There would be a traffic jam at the gate of the sheepfold for the sheep who are trying to get away from that man. And that's what we must do, and that is denounce him as a false uh, pope, that is, as a wolf, not someone who is a shepherd of the sheep, but as a wolf who wants to devour the sheep. And... Uh, uh, that, that's the only proper response that Catholics can have. The, our Lord said that the sheep hear his voice and know him. And so we also know the faith. Uh, we know when Christ is speaking to us because we identify the faith with what our teachers are telling us. That's what St. Paul told us to do. He said, e even if I or an angel of heaven should come and preach to you a gospel different from what I have preached to you, let him be anathema. Those, that's a strong word, anathema. Anathema. Not let us make, let, let us consider him the Pope in certain circumstances or, or that he's in charge of this church or that church or two churches, one Pope of two churches. Let him be anathema. This is what we are told by the Apostle St. Paul. And, and that is the, the proper reaction of the church to this uh, promulgation of this new religion, which is just the, the perfect fulfillment of what St. Pius X told us concerning the modernists. Your Excellency, at the end of his writing, Bishop Williamson uh, says that, like liberals, the city of Acantists are thinking humanly, all too humanly. What do you say about that? Well, I don't see where humanity gets into anything that I have said. Uh, I have defended the indefectibility and infallibility of the Catholic Church, the assistance of the Holy Ghost to, to the government of the Catholic Church, the, to the true Pope and, and to the true bishops of the Catholic Church. That, 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 that Where is humanity in that? Those are supernatural, invisible things that come from God. How am I thinking humanly? He would like to accuse us of being emotional in our response, thinking, well, the Novus Ordo is so horrible that these people could not be popes. 
That's not true. There's no emotion in this at all. This is a recognition of the true nature of the Catholic Church, of, of the assistance of the Holy Ghost to the Catholic Church, and the fact that this false religion cannot come down from God, cannot come down from the authority of Christ, nor from the authority of the Pope. Pope Pius XII said that the authority of Christ and the authority of the Pope are one and the same authority. So, so that if we hand to them the papacy, we have to hand to them at the same time the Catholicity of the Novus Ordo, the Catholicity of Vatican II. We have to hand to them the legitimacy of everything that has been done for the past 50 years, and then we have to turn around and condemn ourselves. Your Excellency, why do you think Bishop Williamson is attacking city vacantism now? Is it because of Francis, because of our positions becoming more popular? Well, I think Francis is a, a big factor in it. Uh, the, there is really no longer any reason for us to, to make our arguments when Francis is saying all of the horrendous things that he has been saying for the past three years. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we rest our case, so to speak. The prosecution rests its case because the witness is, is better than any argument that the prosecution could put forth. That is, Bergoglio's statements are so damning that anyone with a brain can figure out that that man is not a Roman Catholic. I don't see how anyone could say that that man is a Roman Catholic. I don't see how anyone with, who is honest and has a brain could say that that man is a Roman Catholic. And so uh, I think that, yes, people are waking up to what we're saying and have been saying for all of these years. Ratzinger was the type of person who, for most people, could hide his uh, lack of orthodoxy under the, the beautiful red shoes and the beautiful copes and, and the miters and so forth. Uh, he was deceiving to many people. Also, he did not express himself very clearly. You had to dig into Ratzinger to really find the heresies in most cases. But Bergoglio is very clear. He, he is a person who says his mind, and he, therefore his heresies are apparent to even the average person. And I, I do think that, uh, yes, uh, his resistance priests, the priests in his own movement, are, uh, have one eye on, say, the vacantism. Uh, I know it to be true. Well, thank you, Your Excellency. Anything else you'd like to add to, to this uh, uh, interview? Uh, yes, I would say this, that for as long as you hold up Bergoglio or any of those Vatican II popes as true popes, you are going to lead the sheep back to them. The very reason why the Society of St. Pius X is now on the verge of leading the priests, their own priests, and their many thousands of people back to the modernists is because they fail to take the right position, which I have described in this video. Uh, they fail to take the right position concerning the, the, the nature of these popes, these Vatican II popes, that they are not true popes. If you hand to them the papacy, as I said, you hand to them all legitimacy, you hand to them the assistance of the Holy Ghost, and the logic will, will have its day in the minds of the people, eventually. Maybe not today, but eventually that logic will have its day in the minds of the people, and they will go back to those prelates and will be devoured by them. And that's exactly what is happening. That's why the resistance that Bishop Williamson founded is trying to function in order to at least have perhaps 5 or 10 percent of them not be eaten by the wolf. But the reason why they're going to be eaten by the wolf is precisely because Archbishop Lefebvre and his followers failed to take the correct position concerning the identity of those phony popes who have given us Vatican II and its reforms. Well, thank you, Your Excellency, for your time and for this uh, response to Bishop Williamson's, I would say, attacks. Thank you. Thank you very much.